Scripture reading this morning is from Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, and we'll be reading from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 18 through 31. Listen to the word of God. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks demand wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. In order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. For the last couple of weeks, we have been talking about Jesus and his early ministry. And this week, we're gonna skip a number of years to find Paul confronting one of the churches that he had founded, and he's confronting them because of their inability to get along with each other. Different groups in the church at Corinth had aligned themselves with different teachers. Some of them said, I am with Paul. Others said, I am with Apollos. And others, I am with Cephas, or I am with the anointed one. And Paul asked, has the anointed one been split up into many tiny pieces? Do you think Paul was crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Certainly not. And in Corinth then, in addition, was the issue of the church members who seemed to be status conscious and esteem driven. Corinth, 
in first century was famous for being a city of social climbing wannabes. In the Roman Empire, status was most important and the competition for honor, that was one of their best games. Boasting was the way of Rome and it was deeply ingrained in the culture and you could see it both on their monuments and in their behaviors in Corinth. Now with this reading, Paul is turning everything inside out in this status-driven culture because God turned everything upside down in Christ. Eloquence. Eloquence was very valued in Corinth. And so Paul bragged about his inability to speak well. If they valued leisure for the pursuit of the good life, Paul boasted about manual labor. They valued titles and labels and they had them all framed in this status hierarchy. And Paul valued spirit giftedness for everyone. Sound familiar? Paul's message to this church of the crucified Christ haunts that church first, points its finger at that church, and urges the church to clean up their own act first. And that's for them, but is it also for us? If we ask the question, what does God value? For each individual of us, ask yourself the question, what is it God values? I think it's authenticity, personal authenticity. I want you to consider this. The incarnation of Jesus Christ is totally personal. When Jesus calls you, it's totally, absolutely personal. The cost of grace is personal. Jesus paid personally to provide us with free grace, and we must pay personally to live within that grace. Why do you think Jesus died for you and for me if it wasn't personal? What do you think Jesus expects of each of us if it's not something personal? According to John Walker in his book, Costly Grace, the God of the universe launched a rescue mission for you, his beloved creation, at the expense of Jesus, his only begotten son. Jesus didn't come in the abstract as some nebulous idea of love and forgiveness and grace. Rather, Jesus came as a human being and he appeared in human likeness. And folks, you can't get any more authentic and personal than that. Last week, we touched upon the difference between cheap grace and costly grace. And the definitions 
or by Diedrich Bonhoeffer. Cheap grace is the justification of sin without the justification of the repentant sinner. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ. If we do something wrong, if we sin, we say to ourselves, uh, that's okay, God will forgive me. I just bestowed grace on myself and God was not part of that transaction. There was no repentance. There was no turning from the sin. We say to ourselves, it's okay. It's not that bad. Cheap grace requires no contrition. We don't even have to desire to be delivered from our sins. We just want to feel forgiven. Costly grace, on the other hand, calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It's costly because it condemns sin and it's grace because it justifies the sinner. It's costly because it cost God the life of his son. Costly grace is the incarnation of Christ. It is the call of Jesus when the disciple left his nets and followed. As in our reading this morning, as Christianity spread and the church became more secularized, the realization of costly grace gradually faded and the world was Christianized and grace, grace became its common property. It seems that only the monastic movement remembered that grace costs, that grace meant following Jesus Christ. The justification of the sinner in the world disintegrated into the justification of sin and the world. Costly grace was turned into cheap grace without discipleship. Bonhoeffer writes, the Christian life comes to mean nothing more than living in the world and as the world and being no different from the world. The upshot of it all is that my only duty as a Christian is to leave the world for an hour or so on Sunday morning and go to church to be assured that my sins are forgiven. I need no longer try to follow Christ. For cheap grace, which is the bitterest foe of discipleship, cheap grace has freed me from all of that. This cannot be true, can it? I read Bonhoeffer, which was written almost a century ago, and frankly, it cuts me to the quick. We cannot be that church. We cannot be those people. We need to be different. The church has for many decades focused on the eternal part and neglected the life part. We have emphasized believing and short-souled becoming. 
We have championed getting people into heaven and often forgotten about getting heaven into people. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not a transaction. It is an invitation to the kind of transformation that leads to an inspirational life, the glorious spectacle of real holiness, authentic and personal discipleship. As we participate in Holy Communion this morning, let's take this opportunity to be real with ourselves. Let's be brutally honest. God wants our honesty. He wants our integrity up close and personal. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, yes, we have bestowed cheap grace on ourselves. Yes, we feel justified if we come to church on Sunday and forget about discipleship the rest of the week. We have opted for cheap grace to forgive ourselves. We have looked down on others because they're not like us. We have gathered in holy huddles to exclude others. Dear Lord, forgive us of our sins and put us on the road to discipleship. We love you, Lord. We want to follow you. We want to grow in your love and we want to go on to perfection. Show us the way. It's difficult and it's daunting to be in the world, but not part of the world. Forgive us our sins and help us to repent in the way you would have us repent. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.